Hello and welcome once again to Murphy's Music Reviews. And on today's show, we're talking about what I'm calling George Harrison's Dark Horse Trilogy. That's uh, starting with his album Dark Horse and going on to his first album on the Dark Horse label. So Dark Horse, Extra Texture, and 33 and a Third. Uh, so yeah, it's not really considered a trilogy by anybody but me, uh, but maybe it will be after this, and you'll maybe, maybe you'll see why. Uh, Anyway, uh, that, as you can see, my brother, the works, has done another painting again. Uh, this time, uh, rather than trying to recreate the cover of George Harrison's Dark Horse album or any of those other albums, uh, he's done his own uh, artistic interpretation of it. And so there it is over there. I think it's really nice. And you can buy it on a t-shirt or a mug or I think a hat or various other things at our tea public store, which there'll be a link for in the description. Uh, and after doing that little bit of advertising, uh, it's time for our sponsorship announcement. Murphy's Music Reviews is proudly sponsored by Home for the LD Lee. Uh, for all your Laserdisc needs, and also HD DVDs. Now you may notice we have the Planet of the Apes box set here. You may be thinking that we have that because we are apes. Uh, that is partially true, but the reason that it's here is because Tom Scott did the music for Conquest for the Planet of the Apes, and he's also connected to the albums we're talking about today. Uh, he wrote the music to that to that film, uh, and it was around the same time that he would be starting to work with George Harrison. Uh, he's also worked with Joni Mitchell and all kinds of other people, but we're not talking about the day. So, uh, yeah, uh, go check out Home for the L.D. Lee. Uh, I believe that the version of the fifth film in this set, uh, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, is a slightly longer cut that, than is usually available. Uh, it's also kind of harder to get some of these films these days because uh, they're owned by 20th Century Fox, which is now owned by Disney, and don't get me started on that. But yeah, uh, if you want to get it on Laserdisc, um, they may have it at home for the LD Lee. I think that's where we got our copy from. Uh, so um, yeah, they're an amazing shop. Uh, lots of great bargains there. So yes, go and support them, please, because they are supporting us. Thank you. Now, we're not going to cover all of George's career leading up to Dark Horse, just because that, that would take too long. Uh, and we're guessing most of you probably know who he is already. So uh, if you want to go and look up that on somewhere, um, then, yeah, you can do that. But we're just going to talk about the albums, uh, otherwise we'd be here all day. Well, prior to this album, George had sort of been one of the more successful ex-Beatles. Uh, his first album, All Things Must Pass, is one of the greatest albums of all time. And it was actually received as such. Uh, often when someone releases something that good, it gets overlooked. But uh, no, it was actually a huge hit at the time. Uh, his next album, Living in the Material World, was also a big hit. Uh, there was also the content for Bangladesh. So yeah, he seemed to be doing really well. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't doing so well in his private life uh, with the breakup of his first marriage. Uh, that sent him into uh, alcoholism and drug dependency. And so he sort of... When you, get, when you get to Dark Horse, he's sort of on a downward spiral, and he got sick during the making of it, uh, which is also appropriate for us, because we still all have COVID at the time of recording, uh, which is why my voice sounds odd, and that's also why, well, he didn't have COVID, he had laryngitis. Uh, that's why George's voice sounds a bit off on this album. Uh, but you won't notice that from the first song, because it's an instrumental, and it's called Harry's On Tour. Harry's On Tour, Harry's On Tour, <laughs> Thank you. 
So this album has a more soul funk influence to it uh, compared to his previous albums, uh, which have perhaps been leaning more onto the folk rock and things like that. And yeah, it sort of goes for a bit more of an almost party vibe at times, but it's also quite dark because he was going through all of that thing, like the drug dependency and the alcoholism and the breakup of his wife, breakup with his wife, and then he got sick. And you do get this odd combination of some of these very upbeat songs, and then you get some very downbeat songs. Uh, so it's sort of like some of them perhaps he wrote while he was partying, and other ones were coming down the next day, I don't know. Uh, but there's a song called Simply Shady that I really like. feel that the, the emotion really comes across in that song and maybe the fact that he does have that hoarse voice it does sort of it actually I think it adds to it actually normally you would think that would take away from it but I think because he sounds horrible and no, not not to say that he's not singing in key because obviously he's, he's still hitting the notes but I think because his voice sounds so rough it adds to it it makes it feel more like you know he's really gone through some shit and um, I don't know if I should say it that way but I'm going to and that's how I've said it so yeah and then there's a song called So Sad, uh, which has been described as the antithesis of George's earlier song, Here Comes the Sun. Uh, it starts with, well, the winter has come, eclipsing the sun. And it just sort of feels like you're moving away from that late 60s, early 70s, uh, happy hippie time into this kind of much darker world. And it, again, people will probably complain about it as being maybe too depressing or something like that. But I, I think that it works. I think that he really gets the, the message across and he really gets the feeling and emotion across through the music. And again, I think possibly the, the hoarse voice probably adds to it because it sounds lived in. It doesn't sound like someone who's never had a problem in their life uh, singing about this stuff. It sounds like it's coming from someone that's really experienced it and is still experiencing it at the time of recording the song. And a cold will now go Not much The title track, Dark Horse, is sort of similar to what you'd expect uh, musically, uh, sort of a co acoustic folk rock kind of sound. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a great song. And this is one of the ones where I think that actually maybe if he'd waited a bit to record it, uh, it would have sounded better. This one, I don't think the hoarse voice really helps it. In fact, he was named by, he was given the nickname by the US press, Dark Horse, because his voice was hoarse rather than Dark Horse, as in, you know, clip clop thingy. <laughs> Cliff clop thingy. That's what they do, isn't it? I suppose so. <laughs> You're always criticizing while I'm trying to record these videos.
Now, if you really like the big Phil Spector sound that was on All Things Must Pass, then you might like this one. It's called Ding Dong. George actually had hopes for that becoming sort of like a Christmas, New Year, big hit song that would come out every year. Unfortunately, it didn't really take off. Um, we like to play it around here every time because I just think it is a great song. And I just think that it does sort of suit that sort of post-Christmas into the New Year feeling of, you know, New Year, let's start again sort of thing. Um, but it didn't really have the, the success that he was hoping for, unfortunately. But I think it's great and I think the video is a lot of fun too. It is also a cover of the Everly Brothers hit uh, Bye Bye Love, uh, which George has also written some new lyrics for to make it about the breakup of his marriage. And uh, I believe he also plays all of the instruments on it, or at least most of them. So that's sort of something interesting. And uh, yeah, we'll play a bit of that now. Bye -bye. There's also a song called Maya Love, in which George shows off his amazing slide guitar skills. Every now and then, members of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones come together, and that is something that happens on this song. It is Far East Man, which is co-written by Ronnie Wood, or as he's credited on this album, Ron Wood If You Let Him. Uh, this was because that in those days it was difficult for artists to appear on records on different labels, and so they had to come up with pseudonyms. At various points, George would show up on other people's records as things like El Angelo Mysterioso, uh, Harry Georgeson, and various other unusual nicknames. I think he produced Monty Python's Lumberjack song under the name P. Reducer, and just things like that. So, uh, yeah, so Ron Wood, if you let him. Uh, and we've actually got a clip of him singing this rather than George, because uh, George never performed it live. Uh, but Ronnie did. So uh, here's Ronnie Wood with Slash and Andrea Corr. Well, I 
That's a pretty good song. Although personally, I think that of all, of all the songs on this album, I'd say it's probably the weakest. Um, it's still a good song, though. I just think maybe it's a bit too slow for me. But yeah, I like it. It's just yeah, kind of middle of the road. And then we get to the final song, and most of this album has sort of been devoid of George's usual spiritual self. Uh, but then he went to India to spend some time with his friend Ravi Shankar, uh, his mentor Ravi Shankar, really. And, um, yeah, he sort of came back in a much better mood and sort of had connected back to his uh, Hare Krishna beliefs and things like that. And so this is sort of the more the Krishna-based song on the album. And if you're not into that whole religious thing, uh, I know I'm not, but uh, I actually just really like the song. I think that it's very uplifting. And I think that after some of the, the heavier stuff that's on this record, uh, you do kind of need that levity at the end, which, you know, it's, for him it was a very serious religious thing, but... It is just a very sort of upbeat song sort of to close out the album with. And I think that was a very smart move. I think had he had closed the album with So Sad or Simply Shady, which are great songs, but I think it would leave you uh, in a negative headspace, whereas this way he sort of gets all of that out of the way earlier. In fact, it's all on side one. Uh, and then you get into the more sort of spiritual side towards the end. And yeah, so I think that it's a great album, and I'm going to give it the traditional four out of four opposable thumbs up. As much as the Murpha loves that album, uh, the press at the time didn't. It got very negative reviews, uh, as did the tour. While well, he still had laryngitis, and so that what they call it, it was supposed to be the Dark Horse tour it became the Dark Horse, as in horse voice tour. I've seen footage from the tour. I've listened to some of the recordings from that tour, and I think that it's bold the way that he did sort of reinvent some of his songs. But I could see how that that would be annoying if you've gone to hear the old classic Beatles songs and he's doing them in this sort of more uh, soul-inspired versions, a lot slower, and sort of with different lyrics, like changing something so so that instead of saying something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover, uh, it's something in the way she moved and found herself another lover. So it's kind of, uh, it's a bit different like that. But if you go into it with the right sense of humor, which I think is probably how he was intending it, that kind of self-deprecating humor that George had, I think that yeah, I think that that would. I think it's a lot of fun, and there are some great videos out there of the tour. Uh, unfortunately, there is a well, there is a professionally shot version of a whole show. In fact, I think possibly several shows, but it's never been released because George wasn't happy with it. Uh, as stated before, he was in a very dark place, and I think maybe looking at that footage sort of reminded him of that time. Uh, only one song has come out in full, but there's plenty of fan-made videos from the various bits of fan footage. Uh, so yeah, it's well worth checking out. We might just play a few clips here.
Now, part of the reason why George got sick is probably because he was very busy. Uh, he was just constantly working on something. He was either working on his own album, he was uh, setting up the record label, uh, he was producing albums for an act called Splinter, and as well as Ravi Shankar, and he was also producing a movie called uh, Little Malcolm and the Battle Against the Unix or something weird like that. I think it's the, the shorter title is just Little Malcolm, but the full title, I, I know there's something to do with Unix in there. Uh, you can Google that in your own time. But um, yeah, so he was very busy with that. Uh, then we were just on the cusp of the uh, the My Sweet Lord lawsuit coming up, um, which is something that get, does get hinted at a bit later. So we'll get to that then. And so, yeah, he was now basing himself in L.A., uh, he was living out of a hotel, and he was sort of living that rock star lifestyle with lots of, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, going to see lots of shows, hanging out with lots of his friends, but also, you know, maybe doing a few things that he shouldn't be doing. Uh, he later referred to this as his naughty period. And, yeah, he was just sort of living the high life of a rock star, which is something that George generally didn't do. Uh, and drummer Jim Keltner, who has worked with George rather a lot over the years, uh, he sort of said that it was probably a mistake to record the album here rather than at Friar Park, because I think that at Friar Park, George could just kind of do things his own way and wasn't going to be bothered and wasn't going to be sort of subjected to the rock star lifestyle, which I don't think he really had all that much interest in. But um, if he was there and it was happening, it was just it, he let it happen. So I guess it's on him as well. But he could have also gone to his usual studio. Uh, it's, there's also some people that have speculated that he rushed this album out because of the negative press towards Dark Horse. Uh, his voice was now a bit better, and so I think that he was hoping that maybe that would help. But so a few of the songs weren't weren't completely sort of written, and I think he did just sort of rush it out. It does feel rushed, uh, but it's still a pretty good album, and it starts with an actually an older song. Uh, this was from uh, earlier session from 1971, which was called You. George took what he'd recorded. Uh, that one was with Phil Spector. It was actually originally intended for a Ronnie Spector album. Uh, and yeah, George took what they'd recorded then and did some more overdubs on it, added his own vocals, and it became the opener to Extra Texture, Read All About It, or as it's sometimes referred to as Oh No, Not Him Again, because if you look at the inside cover, it says that Oh No, Not Him Again. Now, the best song on this album is probably This Guitar Can't Keep From Crying, and if you look at So Sad as being part two of Here Comes the Sun, this one is kind of part two of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Get 
few other songs on this album that are kind of forgettable. Don't be so hard on the one that you love. It's a wall that you love. We think so we love. Don't be so hard on the one that you love. It's a wall. Things like, oh baby, you know I love you. It's just, I think it was him trying to do something like Smokey Robinson from what I've read. Uh, I don't know, I just think that it's kind of boring, personally. There's a couple of other songs like that that just don't really seem to go anywhere. They're just sort of slow, kind of soul ballads. Uh, but then you do get some really cool stuff on here. Uh, I do really love the song Tired of Midnight Blue. The song came into view As I sat with the tears in my eyes The song came up on you And as you smiled song and extra texture is ladies and gents his name is legs uh, this is a tribute to george's good friend legs larry smith who was the drummer for the bonto dog doodah band <laughs> Reminds me, I must do an episode of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band at some point. They have a very interesting history, and lots of connections to the Beatles as well. And yeah, I think it's an album of great moments, but I just don't think that it's an al a great album in its own right. I think if it was to maybe have made it into an EP, it would have made an amazing EP. Uh, or if he decided to maybe scrap some of the lesser songs and sort of continue recording it for a bit longer, he might have made an amazing album. Uh, but instead, this one just only really gets the two out of four opposable thumbs up. Everyone from Oxford Town went down to the Maria Now at this point, George was well into the lawsuit with uh, bright tunes over My Sweet Lord, and so that was not really going to do much to increase his mood at the time. Uh, but something that did sort of help with that was he started hanging out with Eric Idle from Monty Python. And he appeared on Eric Idle's first post-Python show, which was called Rutland Weekend Television. 
And tonight, ladies and gentlemen and audience, is a very, very, very special occasion here on Rutland Weekend Television because we are very privileged to have with us a star of immense magnitude, a man who's been on much bigger television stations than this one, but we hope none more warmer nor more sincere. The man, none other than the incomparable Mr George Addison, and he'll be here later on on the programme singing some of his bigots, my sweet civil lord, etc., etc. But first of all, Jim Lander. Thirty pieces of uh, parrot. Good evening. Hi, uh, hi, Long John. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Very nice, very nice. Very nice. Uh, yes, you'll be able to sing in a minute. Thank you. I sing. Yes, in a minute, ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Lennox of the Quiet One from the Fab Four will be here to sing you some of his best. Uh, I'm not here to sing. I'm here to act. Act. Yes. Here? Yes, a high Jim Lad on the dead man's chest. The pirate sketch. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. There's, uh, there's no pirate sketch down on the running order, I'm afraid. No pirate sketch down here, see? Uh, no pirate sketch? No. Now I'll help you, then. Arr, I know that guy. Well, yes, that is George Harrison. That's who we're doing an episode about. No, 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 that's, that's Captain Morgan. What? No, 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 it's George Harrison in a pirate costume. No, no, it's it's Captain Morgan, I'm telling you now. I, I know him anywhere. I see him all the time. Arr. Are you sure? George Harrison died in 2001. Oh, well, I've seen him since then. Then it's not him, is it? Arr, I think he may have been may, may have convinced everybody he's dead and he's living as a pirate now. Arr, he's Captain Morgan, he makes rum, and he has a, a plantation somewhere in the Caribbean. Arr. What kind of plantation? Arr, I don't know. I don't look into his personal affairs. Arr. I don't know. I think that is... I don't know. I think that sounds more like something that Furphy would make up. I'm, I'm pretty sure that George is, is unfortunately no longer with us. Arr, I don't know. I, th that looks a lot like Captain Morgan to me. Okay, well, um... We'll look into that later, shall we? Arr, okay. Jim Ladd is the black spot and 13 men on a dead man's chest. Yes, thank you, thank you, yes, thank you, yes. Thank you. yes. Thank you. yes. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Shove off, thank you, thank you, yes, in a minute. Uh, so, yes, I'm not sure about the Pirate King's conspiracy theory that George is a pirate, but, um, yeah, um, I don't know how to get off for that subject, really, so, um, yeah, let's just play a bit more. Well now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, Mr. George Addison sings. Life for me, all my friends are pirates, and the same the BBC. I got a jolly Roger, it's a black and white and fast. So get out of your skull and crossbones, and I run it off your mask. With yo ho ho and ha ha dee ha ha, yo ho ho and ha ha dee yo yo. I got a jolly Roger, it's a black and white and fast. Get out of your skull on crossbow I run it up your fast so aside from his new friendship with Eric Idle, uh, he also had a new girlfriend in the form of Olivia. Uh, she would later become his wife. And things started to look up for him. Unfortunately, then he got struck down with hepatitis. But in hindsight, that may have actually been a good thing in the sense that it was what got him to stop drinking. He'd been very heavily drinking and doing lots of drugs, and this sort of was where he started to clean up his act. So, as terrible as it was, and nobody wants to go through that. And yeah, in the end, I think it had a positive outcome on his life. So then we get to 33 and a third, and you can sort of tell, just from listening to that album, that he's certainly in a much better place uh, emotionally, spiritually, physically. 
And yeah, he just seems to be in great spirits throughout the album. Uh, it starts with a new recording of an older song. He'd actually demoed it during the All Things Must Pass sessions, but in a much different style. Uh, here it has a sort of funk feel to it, and it's called Woman, Don't You Cry For Me. After that, there is a sort of Cat Stevens-ish song, Dear One. The spirit sings to you now. Creation stands at your feet. My feelings call to you now. Dear One, I love for you. You hear my spirit sing to you. You see creation. Personal note, my friends the Gay Rillers actually sang that song at their wedding, so yeah. Hello Terence and Carlos if you're watching. One of the big singles from this album was this song, which was parodying the whole situation that he was going through with Bright Tunes and Abco and all of the people that were suing him, basically. And yeah, he decided to make a song and a video that really sort of took the piss out of the situation. Uh, this video unfortunately was played on Saturday Night Live, and any time I play anything that's owned by NBC, specifically Saturday Night Live, uh, they don't like that, and they don't own this, and they don't own any of the other clips that they've claimed that they've owned, so um, it's going to be difficult, but we're going to try and get it on, on here, uh, because they will claim that they own it, even though they don't. Uh, they did it with the Paul McCartney video, so yeah, they don't own it, they didn't produce it, but they'll claim it, so... Um, Hang on, how am I going to do this? Uh, hang on. So, so what is it you want me to do? Or just, just, just turn with your back to the camera. Really? Yeah, I think that'll work. Okay. This song, there's nothing tricky about it. George would also appear on that episode of Saturday Night Live in person, uh, at first doing a few sketches and also doing a couple of duets with Paul Simon. Uh, we're not going to show those because they definitely do own those. Uh, but they also played the other video for that, one of the other videos from that album, Crackerbox Palace. <laughs> Another 
song on the album is called Beautiful Girl, a tribute to his new girlfriend and soon to be wife, Olivia. Never seen such a beautiful girl, got me shaking inside. Going on me from deep within her eyes. Not the kind you go handing around, wanna keep her right there. But this love it don't come, there's no surprise. There's also another cover, this time of the song True Love. This album also contains a tribute to Smokey Robinson, uh, but this time it's a tribute to the man rather than trying to write a song in his style, and I think it works a lot better. So here it is, Pure Smokey. Another highlight of the album for me is It's What You Value. Someone's driving at 4.50 And his friends are so wild They're still in the stick shifters They're feeling much more style But I'm found It's all up song actually came about because George's drummer, Jim Keltner, uh, although he doesn't play on this album, uh, he played on pretty much all of the other ones, um, he didn't want to get paid for his appearances on the 1974 tour. Uh, instead, he wanted a Mercedes car. And so George, being a car guy, he was really well into Formula One and things like that. And so, yeah, he bought him a, a nice Mercedes sports car. Uh, and I think that sort of caused a bit of friction with the other people that were in the band. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what that song was about. Uh, I think it also just plays into George's love of cars. I think if you look at Dark Horse as kind of the downward spiral, and then Extra Texture is hitting rock bottom, and this is sort of the, the climb back up to sort of... And I think actually this might be his... I think this is his second best album that he ever made, which is a bold claim because he made some amazing albums, but I think if you look at All Things Must Pass as his masterpiece, uh, I think this is pretty close second.
I'd say that the weakest song on the album is Learning How to Love You, which I don't think is a bad song, but again, as with uh, Far East Man, I think that it just, it's a bit slow. Uh, but other than that, it's a good song. album it just had a very sort of positive vibe to it. it it's got a lot of hope to it it also has a lot of humor to it with cracker box palace uh, which a lot of people think in fact including me until recently uh, that it's about his house friar park but that's actually not the case they did shoot the video there uh, it's actually about a house in america owned by a comedian called lord buckley who george was a big fan of and he met he met his manager and they ended up giving him the tour, so he got to see this house, Crackerbox Palace, and that's what the song was about. Uh, so yeah, it's not actually about Friar Park, although that is what's in the video. So between that and this song making fun of the, uh, the lawsuit, and especially the video, and then having Eric Idle come in and do the, uh, the Pepper Potts voice from Python, uh, it's actually not him in, in the video, it's actually Ronnie Wood. <laughs> Ronnie would if you let him, if you remember from earlier. And yeah, so I, I'm going to give 33 and a third, four out of four opposable thumbs up. I did think about giving it three and a third, but I thought, no, I'll give it the full four. <laughs> but that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to check out the, uh, the Tee Public if, you're, if you want to get a t-shirt or something for the show. Uh, or if you want to get Laserdisc, go to Home for the LD Lee. Uh, I am the Murpher. This has been Murpher's Music Reviews. <laughs>